Hello, and welcome to DM It All, a show where we talk about Dungeons & Dragons books and tabletop gaming history. In this episode, we'll try extra hard to live up to that premise, as we'll be analyzing the original edition of Dungeons & Dragons. To do that though, we'll have to go all the way back before the first edition, before Dungeons & Dragons, and even before the concept of tabletop roleplaying itself. The story of D&D began in the early 1970s with Gary Gygax and Chainmail, his first professionally published tabletop game. Chainmail was a miniatures war game similar to modern games such as Warhammer or Battletech, except Chainmail was created nearly a decade before either of those franchises. For those that don't know, wargaming is a hobby over a century old. The idea is to simulate large-scale battles using miniature figurines and modeled terrain. Players would compete with a customized army against another opponent. Chainmail was originally created by Jeff Parent, one of Gygax's wargaming associates at their club in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Gygax expanded upon Perrin's rule set in wargaming newsletters and magazine articles until the product caught the attention of Guidon Games. Guidon Games was an Indiana-based wargaming company that would go on to hire Gygax for multiple projects. The company was founded in 1970, but it would only last three years before being shut down, with Chainmail being Guidon Games' biggest success story. While Chainmail itself focused on realistic medieval combat, the first edition also came with a 15-page supplement for more Tolkien-esque fantasy settings. This was due to Gygax's wargaming group becoming bored of their typical medieval wargames, as well as the group itself being pretty big into Lord of the Rings. Gygax himself claims he was more of a fan of sword and sorcery style fantasy, like Conan the Barbarian, but he wanted to please his friends, so a lot of very specific Tolkien references made it into the game. This fantasy supplement was basically a Tolkien ripoff, but it helped generate a lot of ideas that would become synonymous with D&D in particular. For example, the dragons introduced in Chainmail can be directly compared to the modern chromatic D&D dragons. Trolls are also far more similar to their durable D&D counterparts, rather than the ogre-like trolls from The Lord of the Rings. The Chainmail Trolls were instead based off of the much more fearsome trolls from Paul Anderson's Three Hearts and Three Lions. This novel would also serve to inspire D&D's alignment system and the Paladin class. Stronger human units known as heroes and superheroes were specifically introduced for this fantasy supplement, as player armies needed these stronger fighters to even stand a chance against trolls and dragons. Leveling up as a concept was not present yet, but these hero and superhero units would eventually become the power tiers for D&D's original combat system. Characters would essentially start out as random infantrymen and level up into heroes and superheroes over time. Perhaps the most significant connection between Chainmail and D&D is the wizard unit. Many of the iconic wizard spells first showed up in this supplement of all places. Some major examples included Haste, Protection from Evil, Polymorph, and Anti-Magic Shell. Many of these spells function similar to the iconic D&D versions too, with Lightning Bolt firing in a straight line, while Fireball had a circular area of effect. There were 16 unique spells altogether, and two options for missile abilities, making this the most involved unit of the entire supplement. There were even six tiers of the Wizard class, with Sorcerers and Warlocks serving as weaker versions with less spell power. D&D's other co-creator, Dave Arneson, was a wargaming fan from the University of Minnesota. Arneson met Gygax in 1969 at the Gen Con Gaming Convention, a convention founded by Gygax himself. The pair were going to work together on a naval war game for Guidon Games, titled Don't Give Up the Ship! Parallel to this, Arneson was also developing a Napoleonic war game with his friend David Wesley. The game, called Brownstein, was an experiment by Wesley to add more players to the war games at the time that usually included just two players and one referee. This was done by Wesley introducing more roles outside of just the military commanders. In Bronstein, a player could take on a non-combat position, like a banker or a mayor, and strive for different goals outside of violent conquest. This essentially established the idea of the role-playing game, with players identifying with a single unit instead of controlling an entire army. Arneson and Wesley took turns refereeing these games, and the role of the wargaming referee transitioned into what we would now consider a dungeon master. Wesley was ordered to active duty for the army in 1970, so Arneson was left with exclusive refereeing duties, 
He didn't want to continue developing Braunstein with Wesley gone, so he began brainstorming an alternative game for his friends to play. Arneson took inspiration from Gygax's fantasy chainmail rules and cooked up Blackmore, a system that would become D&D's first campaign setting. Blackmore had more sci-fi elements than most traditional D&D campaigns, with advanced space aliens showing up in the earliest adventures. Despite these anomalies, Blackmore introduced many other ideas that would become ubiquitous with a standard D&D game. For instance, Arneson's group controlled characters that would be consistent from session to session as they ventured for treasure and journeyed into dungeons. Arneson also strayed from the chainmail rules, creating new ideas such as hit points and character levels. In 1972, Arneson and Blackmore player David McGarry met with Gary Gygax to pitch McGarry's board game. The game was called Dungeon! Exclamation point, and it was based on the Blackmore campaign. Gygax was interested in Blackmore after discussing it with the pair, and asked Arneson to referee a game for him. The experience convinced Gygax that this role-playing idea was the next big thing. He asked for a draft of Arneson's game rules, and began running his own separate game called Greyhawk. The two collaborated over phone and mail, while playtesting their separate campaigns. Greyhawk was based on Gygax's history knowledge, with the original map literally being a rebranded map of the real world. When Gygax initially presented Guide on Games with the role-playing premise, the company rejected it. But Gygax would not be deterred, spurred on by his belief in the appeal of role-playing, as well as his fear that competitors would soon come up with a similar product, he decided to publish his idea on his own, without Guide on Games. Thus, Gygax and his associates created a new company, Tactical Studies Rules, aka TSR. D&D was officially released in 1974. Often called the White Box, the very first version was released in a wood grain box. The literal white boxes that came later had the same contents, though. These contents included three short 30-40 to 40 page booklets. One booklet for player information, one for monsters and treasures, and one for adventure building. You can see how much of an amateur company TSR was within these pages, especially in the art. The art of original D&D was the equivalent of the doodles you might find in the margins of a teenager's biology notebook. Bad anatomy, needless nudity, and blatant tracing from comic book art. Specifically, tracings of Doctor Strange and Nick Fury from the 60s Strange Tales comic series. The art would improve with each of the following supplements, but it took a while for D&D products to truly look professional. Another indicator that this was still TSR's adolescent phase was the simplicity of the system itself. D&D was basically a chainmail supplement rather than a new game. The white box that contained the rules even had extra space to accommodate the chainmail booklet. As bizarre as it sounds, players needed the chainmail booklet to figure out certain D&D rules, such as initiative. D&D by itself had no rules for which player would go first, while chainmail assigned speeds to different actions like melee attacks and ranged attacks. The D&D booklets also used the chainmail combat system, ranking different classes based on the hero and superhero tiers of power as they leveled. Fortunately, Dungeons & Dragons also offered its own combat rules for the people that didn't own Chainmail. This alternative rule set would become the trademark D&D combat system, all the way until 3rd edition. It essentially involved looking up an attack table for your class, and seeing what you needed to roll in order to hit every possible armor class. When your dice roll matched an opponent's armor class, it counted as a hit, and then you rolled for damage. Later editions introduced a shortcut called Thaco, an acronym for To Hit Armor Class Zero. Basically, you would write down what you needed in order to hit the maximum armor class instead of constantly referring back to your character's attack table. After all, if you know you can hit armor class zero, it logically follows that you would be able to hit any armor class above it, like 1, 5, or 8. If you find yourself wondering, wait, is it easier to hit an AC of zero than an AC of eight? Realize that equipping better armor back then actually gave characters a lower armor class. This seemingly inverted system meant that you had to have high attack rolls to hit low armor classes. This was not the easiest system to explain to newbies, which is why it was eventually phased out. The white box had only three classes to start with. One of these was the Fighting Man, the prototype for the future fighter. The Fighting Man was a pretty self-explanatory class, since all it really did was fight 
Their only class feature was access to the best weapons, armor, and attack bonuses. The magic user was on the other end of the spectrum, being a poor fighter but having access to a wide array of versatile spells. These characters started off incredibly weak though, as they could not use armor. They also started off with only one spell at level 1, so their utility was strictly limited early on. Magic users that survived the first few levels would grow into the most powerful party members, so it was in the party's best interest to protect and babysit them. The Cleric was the third class, and it was kind of a balance between the two extremes. Pretty good at fighting and magic, but excelling at neither. The Cleric as a fighter could use most of the equipment except for edged weapons, which meant no swords, spears, or even arrows. Being stuck with maces was also a big drawback in and of itself, as magic blades were the best and most commonly found magic weapons in D&D. Cleric's magic users had access to spells, but these spells functioned differently. The magic user relied on book learning for his magic, while the cleric was empowered by his faith to a divine entity. Because of this, clerics had a smaller variety of spells, and they gained them way slower, to the point that clerics had no spellcasting whatsoever at level 1. Despite the different lore and progression though, clerics and magic users subscribed to the same spell mechanics. They could only cast a certain number of prepared spells per day based on their level. Once a spell was cast, it was forgotten until it was prepared again for the next day. This is often called Vancean magic, based on the Dying Earth novel series by Jack Vance. Oddly, despite how much other RPGs have taken from D&D's history, Vancean magic never really caught on outside of D&D. Otter still, perhaps, is that it's a system that survives to this day. We should also note that clerics were more of a general support role back then, rather than the skirmishing healer they play today. They of course had healing spells, but those scaled pretty poorly and were mostly for use outside of battle. The cleric's purpose was to supplement the other class's abilities without outshining them. There is one unique thing they excelled at though, their ability to force undead to flee in terror. This ability would later be known as Turn Undead, and it's basically that scene in horror movies when people ward off vampires by brandishing a cross. Another reason why clerics were awful healers is that healing wasn't really a thing in older D&Ds. And that's because it was way easier to die back then. Once you hit zero hit points, that was it. No saving throw, no negative hit points, nothing but the cold embrace of death. You also rolled for your starting health totals during character creation, so it was possible to have 1 HP at level 1. This allowed something as benign as a strong gust of wind to literally kill an adventurer. Even high stats didn't help much, since rolling high for the constitution attribute only gave plus 1 health per level. And even if you think that's better than nothing, getting high constitution was never a guarantee because you had to roll 3d6 to determine each of your attributes in order. This meant that you had to roll all your character's stats first before you could determine which class might be a good fit afterward. So good luck playing that mage with 4 intelligence. Fortunately, stats in original D&D didn't determine as much as they do compared to future editions. Though they didn't provide a big bonus, they also weren't as big a detriment. For the most part, stats just determined how fast characters leveled in their classes. A fighting man with high strength leveled faster than one with low strength. Magic users leveled faster based on their intelligence, and clerics leveled faster based on their wisdom. Asymmetrical leveling may seem strange nowadays, but leveling differences were an important part of class balance. Consider that each of the classes didn't even have the same amount of possible levels as each other. Clerics had a max level of 8, while magic users had a max level of 11, but clerics leveled faster to make up for the class being weaker in the long run. Players could theoretically go beyond the supposed max levels, but they got fewer new toys past the ranks that were listed in the rulebook. In addition to classes, players were also given the option to make their character a human or one of three fantasy races. But we should note that old school D&D was very human centric, and Tolkien races were not really allowed to deviate from their traditional portrayals due to the strict character creation rules. Elves had to feel like classic fantasy elves, and the same went for dwarves and hobbits, so no parties made up of dwarf wizards or half-orc paladins like you might get today. Non-humans could not reach the max level in any of the classes, and they were banned from most classes outright. Fighting Man was the one class everyone could reliably access, and only humans could become clerics. 
The fantasy races did get racial abilities to make up for these limitations, making them more powerful early on compared to their human counterparts. This echoes the old fantasy idea of humans being generally weaker than the other races, but having the most potential. Dwarves could only become fighting men, and they could only reach fighting man level 6. In exchange for this handicap, dwarves got higher magic resistance, the ability to detect traps, the ability to detect certain architectural constructions, and more language options. Elves, on the other hand, could dual class as fighting men and magic users. We should note that dual classing is not the same as multi-classing in modern D&D. What elves could do is essentially switch between the two classes in between adventures, and they could also use armor, even when playing as a magic user. Elves could only reach 4th level fighting man and 8th level magic user, but being able to cast spells in armor made it one of the stronger builds. On top of this, elves were also better at spotting secret doors than the other races, gained more language options, and were immune to the paralysis of a ghoul's touch. To put it simply, elves were awesome. Hobbits, on the other hand, sucked. They were capped at level 4 and could only be fighting men. Their sole advantage was their magic resistance, a trait that the dwarves also got, making them just shoddier, crappier dwarves. Gary Gygax claimed not to have been a fan of the Lord of the Rings, and his treatment of hobbits and the other fantasy races might be evidence of that. His disinterest in Tolkien was probably exacerbated when Tolkien's estate sent him a cease and desist letter in 1976. This letter caused TSR to change the name of numerous D&D monsters, which is why hobbits in D&D are now called halflings. That covers most of the material in the player-relevant booklet titled Men and Magic. At the end of the booklet is the spell sections. A lot of the iconic spells were present from the start, but the omissions of certain modern staples led to some widely different gameplay. For instance, magic users without Featherfall had to be more wary of heights, and clerics had to wait until level 6 to get an improvement on their first healing spell. Booklet 2 was Monsters and Treasure, and the contents are pretty self-explanatory. Monster stats in Booklet 2 were simple enough to fit on two large tables. Each creature was only given a short paragraph after that for any additional detail. The variety of monsters was expanded from chainmail to include ooze creatures and more mythical beasts, such as unicorns and medusas. The monster table didn't just list the stats and special abilities, but also the number of monsters that would appear during a random encounter, and the type of treasure they carried. Treasure in particular was a crucial component of old school D&D for one important reason. Acquiring it was the best way to gain experience. This may seem weird conceptually, but it made sense from a mechanical standpoint. Combat was so deadly back then that players were often incentivized to avoid it. An ideal scenario would be to swipe a monster's treasure right under its nose without having to fight it at all. Wandering monsters, aka random encounters, were the most important aspect of this idea since they gave almost no benefit to the players. Their primary purpose was to punish players for milling around too long in hostile territory. To get any reward for killing monsters, players had to track down the creature's lair. That's where all the good stuff would be. This experience system encouraged the party to explore, rather than just assault every monster they encounter. It's also worth noting random encounters back then were not supposed to be balanced, at least not the ones on the world map. Out there, players could run into literally anything. First level characters had a chance to walk outside, unexpectedly stumble into a dragon, and then get incinerated immediately. New adventurers therefore had to play smart and evade these encounters as much as possible, which is why rules for combat evasion were detailed in the third booklet, titled The Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. This booklet detailed what would nowadays be considered Dungeon Master's Guide material for world building and running the game. Another major feature of old school D&D that helped players was morale. All non-player characters in unnerving situations had to roll for morale to see if they flee or not. Wimpier foes would surrender more easily, and only certain opponents would fight to the death against all odds. Enemies spotted in a random encounter also didn't necessarily attack on sight either, as they would be given a reaction roll to see how they responded to the party. Like we mentioned before, combat was deadly, and even NPCs weren't eager to die in a pointless fight. The morale roll traces its roots back to Chainmail and other war games, where armies would regularly have to check for morale after taking massive casualties. There were also echoes of wargaming found in the scale of some encounters in original D&D. Players could face up to 300 enemies, and there could even be up to 50 players in a single game. 
However, you would obviously need more referees to coordinate games on this scale. But these huge numbers show the difference between heroes and monsters in original D&D versus the roles they served in later video game RPGs. Older video games were generally more restrictive due to the limited memory space for party sizes, so individual characters were made stronger to compensate. Each one felt like a hero right off the bat, and these early video games set the standard for RPG heroes going forward. But back in D&D, the players were disposable grunts in a small military unit. You were basically taking a random soldier from a chainmail game and imagining what it was like to be them in a massive battle fraught with danger. Characters had a chance to ascend to greatness, but most of them did not. The first two supplements for D&D were named after the first two D&D campaigns, Greyhawk and Blackmoor. Despite the names though, neither supplement gave much detail to their respective campaign worlds. Instead, these books served to expand the basic rules, especially in regards to the Greyhawk supplement. Thanks to this booklet, magic users and clerics had their max level caps get doubled from the original game. Both classes got a ton of new spells to go along with this change including some notoriously game-breaking spells, like Wish and Permanent Spell. Fighting men, on the other hand, got bupkis. On the bright side though, the importance of stats was expanded in this booklet. Nowadays, every class gets attack bonuses from high strength, and dodge bonuses from high dexterity, but only fighting men got these bonuses in the original edition, and only thanks to Greyhawk. Greyhawk also expanded the importance of intelligence, as it now limited the amount of spells a magic user could learn. So there were some attempts to keep casters in line, but overall they became much stronger. This booklet is also where classes got different health totals. Before this, the fighter and magic user both rolled d6s for health, since the white box, as well as chainmail, both used d6s for everything. But now the fighting men got a health buff to d8, while the magic users were downgraded to a d4. This is also the first version of the game, where weapons dealt different damage too. Originally, damage was dealt with, you guessed it, a d6, regardless of their type. So daggers used to be just as deadly as two-handed claymores. It's also worth noting that this is the first book to generally refer to fighting men as fighters instead. Which is a huge buff for this class since fighting man is a dumb name. The D&D races also got expanded a little bit. Half-elves were introduced for the first time, and they were a somewhat better version of the elf. They got the elf bonus languages and bonuses to spotting secret doors, while also being able to progress further in the fighting and magic classes. They could even mix in up to four cleric levels too. The biggest addition for the fantasy races though, was the addition of one of two new classes, the thief class. Like the cleric, the thief was another midway point between the fighter and the magic user, but it was a different style of support class. The thief was focused around skills instead of support spells, although they started off being extremely bad at those skills. In fact, it took the thief until level 6 to get a 50% chance in accomplishing any of its iconic abilities, like opening locks or moving silently. The thief was a terrible fighter too, since they had as much health as the fragile magic user, and could only equip leather armor. Even sneak attacks were harder to pull off back then, since not only were they backstabs, but they had to be literal stabs in the back. So although the Thief was a pretty bad class, it was a huge boon to the fantasy races. Not only did non-humans get bonuses to Thief skills, but it was the first class to not give them a strict max level. This was especially important for the Hobbit, uh, Halfling, don't sue, since the Thief class allowed them to finally progress past level 4. Finally, the worst race could now mainline the worst class, which, jokes aside, is at least kind of appropriate, considering that Bilbo Baggins was the burglar of his adventuring group. The Paladin was the other class introduced in this supplement, and it was way more exclusionary than the Universal Thief. In fact, it was the first class to have stat requirements. Players who rolled higher on their stats could now play strictly better classes, which only served to widen the gap between players. But at least it made the existence of a Paladin in the party lineup feel like a big deal. For the Paladin, players needed to roll almost the maximum amount of charisma possible. They were also required to follow a strict code of honor that demanded they give their treasure to the poor and always perform lawful deeds. 
Failing to follow this code revoked the paladin status and turned the character into a normal fighter. In exchange for following this code, paladins could heal others a little bit and cure diseases once per day. They were immune to diseases themselves and had access to better saving throws. They were also granted a super intelligent warhorse that they could use as a mount. At higher levels, paladins could detect and dispel evil at will. So although the requirements were steep, the indomitable strength the paladin brought was worth the cost. The main additions from the Blackmore supplement were the Assassin and Monk classes. In a nutshell, these were both human-only variants on the Thief. The Monk had the strictest stat requirements out of any class at the time, and it became absurdly powerful at high levels. The trade-off to this was that the Monk was pathetically fragile at the start. Check out our Monk video to learn more about the Monk's legacy as arguably the worst class in D&D history. The Assassin had much less demanding stat requirements than the Monk, but it was only allowed in campaigns based on DM discretion. This class sacrificed two levels of their thief skills for the ability to use insta-death poisons and almost perfect disguises. They also had more health than the thief and could use shields, making them somewhat beefier in combat. Supplementing the assassin was an assassination table, presumably used to determine the odds of completing an assassination mission. The table's purpose isn't really clarified, but the book describes how assassins can gain extra experience by carrying out contract killings on the side. We mention it because a low-level assassin has a 75% chance of outright killing an opponent of equal level. This percentage chance slowly dropped over time to 25%, but the class would absolutely run roughshod over opponents during the low levels for any DM foolish enough to allow it. The third D&D supplement was called Eldritch Wizardry, mostly due to the demons added in the monster section. The majority of the player section was focused on introducing the psionic rules. Fans hated this addition lore-wise, since it meant moving away from traditional fantasy and more towards science fiction, with characters possessing latent psionic abilities outside of magic. Fans also hated this because the rules were confusing and broken. Part of the reason Vancian magic became etched into D&D is probably because the alternative to that was psionics. Aside from demons and psionics, Eldritch Wizardry also introduced the Druid class of all things. The druid idea was already introduced in Greyhawk as a possible monster opponent, but here it was made into a cleric subclass. Druids swapped out Turn Undead and the superior cleric equipment for some minor nature powers like passing through overgrowth, identifying plants, identifying animals, and identifying pure water. Yeah, druids were kind of a step down from clerics. Even their iconic shape changing from modern editions was less impressive back then, since they couldn't turn into any creature larger than a small bear. This ability was primarily for traveling and partially healing the druid than it was for combat. The biggest upside to the class was the fact that its spell list had more elemental and nature-based magic spells sprinkled throughout the usual cleric spell list. However, the cleric list remained the better choice of the two, especially if you wanted the best healing and resurrection spells in the game. Not to mention reaching the most powerful abilities meant that the druid would have to rank up in the druid hierarchy. That may sound appealing, but only a certain number of high-level druids could exist in the world at any point. This notion was also true for monks as well. Eventually, the only way for these classes to level up was to get promoted in the organization they were a part of. And getting promoted usually meant challenging a superior member in combat. Losing the fight effectively de-leveled a character, forcing them to regain experience points until they could try again. After Eldritch Wizardry, there were only two more supplements for original D&D. The last one actually labeled a D&D supplement was Gods, Demigods, and Heroes. This booklet provided stats for characters from mythology, presumably so players could go fight them. Swords and Spells was not technically labeled as a D&D supplement, but it was essentially the replacement for Chainmail. Swords and Spells not only supplied more detailed mass combat rules than Chainmail, but also added more D&D creatures, spells, and items. So fittingly, original D&D began and ended with, well, wargaming supplements. Those were the last published books, but some more important additions were made in the magazine called The Strategic Review. The Strategic Review was a super short-lived publication created by TSR in 1975. The magazine aimed to discuss Dungeons & Dragons and miniature wargaming as a whole. Additionally, it clarified rules, hyped new products, and offered variant rule sets. 
These variant rules included many iconic D&D monsters, such as the Mind Flayer and the Roper. They also introduced three new classes. The first new class was the Ranger, which was basically a variation on the Paladin. The Ranger had more spread out stat requirements than the Paladin, but it demanded the same strict ethical code. The major benefits of this class was the ability to track monsters and gain damage bonuses against giants. The Ranger also got access to both Magic User and Cleric spell lists, though Rangers couldn't learn spells higher than level 3. The second class added through this strategic review was the Illusionist, a variant on the Magic User with high intelligence and dexterity requirements. The class could only go up to level 13, but that was around the point most campaigns ended anyway. Illusionists sacrifice access to magic item variety and spell variety in exchange for a unique magic list focused more on illusions. Some of these spells were pretty powerful and flavorful, such as the ability to turn deceased characters into specters, or the ability to summon shadow reflections of real monsters. One spell, dubbed Shadow Magic, could partially replicate the effects of various offensive magic user abilities, such as Lightning Bolt and Wall of Fire. Shadow Magic could also perfectly replicate the effects of those spells if the victim believed the Illusionist was actually casting the mimicked magic. Spells like this led to the Illusionist becoming the hardest class to adjudicate for Dungeon Masters. The Illusionist and Illusion Magic as a whole could become broken strong if the Dungeon Master didn't make sufficiently skeptical NPCs. The third class added through the strategic review was the Bard. The Bard was essentially a mix of different Bard concepts from history, from Celtic Druids to French Minstrels. This mishmash ultimately led to a jack-of-all-trades concept. Bards could equip any weapon and use chainmail armor, making them sturdier than the Thief in combat. Speaking of the Thief, Bards also got access to Thief skills at one half the effectiveness. And unlike Thieves, Bards got access to magic user spells up to level 7. This was all on top of their Bard features. Bardic lore, for instance, give them a percent chance to know information on almost anything. Bards could also replicate other magical effects using music. Bards at high levels got access to a confusion song, a fear song, and a minor healing song. Not only that, but bards could deploy a charm person effect with their music too. This effect was based on a percent chance derived from the bard's level, and the level of the opponent he was attempting to charm. The mechanics and penalties involved with this effect alone are longer than the descriptions of most classes from this era. The Bard as a whole was probably the strongest and most complicated class available in original D&D, which is probably why this was the only strategic review class to not become a base class when Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was released. It was instead added to the appendix and reworked into something players would have to earn over time by playing a fighter-thief-druid hybrid. The strategic review was eventually cancelled after only seven issues in 1976. It was replaced with a new magazine called Dragon that focused exclusively on role-playing games. TSR tried to keep its wargaming articles alive with another short-lived magazine called Little Wars, but it became clear that D&D was the company's biggest asset by a mile. Technically, some of the early Dragon articles count as original D&D since advanced D&D was just starting to come out around this time but none of these niche last-minute editions were impactful enough to make it into the Advanced Edition or a lot of later editions. The release of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons around 1977 concluded the era of original D&D. There was some transitioning involved, but AD&D is what is considered nowadays to be first edition, with original D&D being edition zero. And so ends our history review on Dungeons & Dragons, or first edition. No, edition zero, the white box that was made of wood, or whatever name you'd prefer. So is it worth it for newer players to try out the white box? We should first start by saying no two groups played the original game the exact same way. The fact that certain elements were clarified only in chainmail, and that some rules were too general and loose, and variant rule sets were commonly sprinkled throughout original D&D's history, made it less structured than modern systems. This is a flaw for those looking for concise and clear rules to play streamlined games. But on the bright side, the nature of this flaw stemmed from the fact that this system is, well, simple by modern standards. It didn't take hours to make characters or run combat scenarios back then. Proficiencies, feats, and skills didn't exist yet, 
combat basically boiled down to moving, attacking, and throwing out the occasional spell. Certain monsters would mix up this format a bit, but even those would have only one or two special abilities to worry about. The downside to this simplicity is that the rules were so simple that you often found yourself begging for more detail at times. Original D&D is probably profoundly confusing for someone not familiar with D&D terms, mechanics, and conventions. These booklets aren't really teaching tools, and their arrangement was often haphazard. It was very easy to overlook a rule, especially since that rule would likely only be mentioned once and not always in the most obvious place. The fact that these books are so small prevented this from being a crippling flaw, but nevertheless, you still needed a somewhat experienced player at the table to explain how the game flowed. If you think that's just our opinion, we should note that this was the exact reason why Basic Dungeons & Dragons was created relatively soon afterwards in 1977. The whole intention of that system was to teach beginners as they played. Basic D&D might be a better option for complete newbies, but it is a different system that simplifies many elements from the original game. Newbies who want a more authentic white box experience might want to try RetroClone instead. Retro clones are tabletop games from other companies that recreate the older D&D editions. A lot of the rights to the D&D rules got loosened after Wizards of the Coast got the license, so a lot of these games are completely free to play. Though there are legal stipulations involved for creating these systems, so don't think that these old rules are public domain or anything. For example, retro clones aren't allowed to use certain iconic D&D trademarks, or even the name Dungeons & Dragons. The biggest and most faithful retro clone for original D&D is probably Swords and Wizardry by Frog God Games. This system helps codify the rule set in a manner closer to modern RPGs. Thankfully, there are many options for newer players curious about the original game. Some of those might be better options than the actual white box itself, but the white box did set the stage for AD&D, basic, and future retro clones. It's a testament to original D&D's strength that many of its rules stuck around for decades, even if it could have been clearer in its elucidation. Thank you for watching DM It All. If you liked this episode, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your fellow adventurers, and subscribe to our channel for future content. Also, comment down below with your thoughts. Did you ever play original D&D? If you didn't, would you consider running it basic, or retro clone? And would you like to see more of these retrospectives for other D&D systems? Thanks again, and we'll see you all next session.